For a second Saturday in succession, the town left it late to rescue a point when they drew 1-1 with Knott's Forest at Kenworth Road. To review the game, alongside me, I've got the Lutonian journalist James Cunliffe. Still in the fight, Jimbo? Yeah, hanging in there, mate. We're hanging in there. Uh, We'll review the game from top to bottom after this intro. Hello everyone, welcome along to another episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast. As I said before the intro, we are reviewing Luton 1, Notts Forest 1. Uh, before we go into the game though, um, James, let's read out a couple of shout outs for correct scores that we had from the preview episode. Not a great deal of time for people to get them in, but two people got the right one. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Luton underscore G-Man Rock 1-1, one, one. Forest equalise in the 99th minute. That was never going to happen. They took all their attacking players off by then. Uh, but correct score, well done. And also, we're feeling in a good mood, aren't we? So, uh, Ray Sue's Travel Channel, your heart might have said 2-1, but we go with the head on this uh, on this programme. And that's, uh, you said 1-1 one, one with your head. So well done to both of you. As promised, shout outs to everyone who gets the correct score. At which point did you think the game was going to end 1-1? One, one? I didn't. <laughs> 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 it, it was one it was a, it was one of those wasn't it that we knew we were going to be knackered it was so obvious we kind of hoped and prayed that Rob was sort of telling Porky's that and that he was going to put Sambi in there somewhere along the lines he didn't but don't matter what these boys have got left until the final whistle blows if you if you hang around and let them hang around they will nab you on the line and they They've done it last Saturday at Crystal Palace and they've done it again Saturday. It's one I just did, I didn't see it coming the, the entire game. Everything's against Luton and it continues to be everything to, everything's against them. And um then you throw on Bez, who knows where the net is, um uh, but he hadn't scored in the Premier League at that point. But you give him a sniff and he does the business. And now now he's scored in every division for Luton. He's also scored in Step five for Cambridge, and he was. I think he scored in the Eastern Counties League or something like that for um for their youth team as well. So he's he's done the rounds, and that was um you know it's kind of a you talked about poetic poetic justice for a different reason, but it was his hundred and fiftieth Luton appearance, and he goes and gets his first Premier League goal to rescue a point that keeps Luton in this fight. And I think that uh, you know story that writes itself really. Yeah, uh, we won't focus too much on Luke just now because we will hear from him later in the podcast. James caught up with him. Of course, he caught up with him, our hero from Saturday. But he was literally the last senior player left that's not a goalkeeper. So, you know, it's, that, that's the kind of bare bones that we're getting to. And it doesn't help when you play 14 men either, does it? I mean, um, we'll come on to the referee a little bit later in the podcast because they're getting worse. There's no way you can claim that they're not getting worse. Um, team, though, James, I just alluded to the fact there was no... Uh, we we kind of hoped that Rob would get Sambi in there in some way, shape or form, but there wasn't. So just the one change, and that was... That's all. Issa Kabore moved from right wing back to uh, left centre back instead of Hashioka, uh, Deiki Hashioka. Pelly came in and... Fair play to your pal, considering you haven't started a game for a long while. That was a seriously, seriously good effort. He played in front of uh, the midfield alongside Ross Barkley, and it was Jordan Clark that went further forward in that sort of one of the two behind the striker role. Um, I suppose that's all Rob had left, really. He couldn't throw Hashioka to the Wolves again after Wednesday night. So, um, But fair play to Issa Kabore. He was up against a tough campaigner in Divock Origi, um, but he gave as good as he got. And nothing sort of came down through Kabore's sort of, I mean, to be fair to Kabore, he's played every position in the game bar up front, hasn't he? But um, yeah, a really good effort, actually. In fact, since that kind of um, switch off against Aston Villa, he's put in three really, really good performances. Yes, he really has. And he was in good form as well before he went to the AFCON. Um, 
and then obviously didn't get in the side for a long time afterwards. But he's putting some yeah really good performances. Uh, I can't fault the lad. He's he's trying as as they all are. They're putting their bodies on the line. I mean literally because yet yeah, again it's two more injuries. Hopefully not serious ones. But how long? How many times have we been saying that about not serious ones? And then you get setbacks and stuff. So um, you know, Pelly got one of them. Um, and for me, that was Penny's best performance of the season. Um, he's not, he's not had many, but, um, I thought he was, I thought he was outstanding really. And he's, when you need somebody to step up and people write him off, but he's done it in the, he's done it in the Premier League really. Um, you know, I, I made him my man a match, even though he went off injured because he was that good all action really. It made one unbelievable block early doors against Steve Origi, which, Led to the injury Led that to his you... injury, yeah. I mean, he's feeling his knee as well, wasn't he? And then um, he's he's made some important attacking moves forward. Um, the one that he crossed, that he chipped over a Forest player, got to the byline, smacked it into the six yard area, and how um, Williams has scuffed that not into the net is is infuriating <laughs> because he'd done all the hard work. But yeah, I thought he was outstanding, and then gets clattered into a into the advertising audience and off he goes. Um, he walked past me in a boot in the mix zone afterwards, but he, he looked, didn't look like he was overly affected by it. Um, he wasn't on crutches and he was moving quite freely. So hopefully it's a precaution. Yeah. Precaution to keep swelling down is how I understand that is um, from some contacts that I've used. Um, why would you write Pelly Rodder Campanzu off? You can't still be doing it 10 years on, can you? I mean, the bloke's a legend. He's not getting a statue at Power Court for no reason. I don't need, I don't know if he's getting a statue. I'm only jesting, <laughs> but he should damn well get the statue yeah. or the or the gaff named after him, one or the other, um, because, you know, he's been absolutely immense. And I said, didn't I, it'd be fantastic if he scored a banger. Well, actually, it was his mate from Lee too that uh, did the job for us. First 15 minutes, I thought this was going to be a very, very good day because of all the players in the Premier League that you give the whole of Bedfordshire to, I'm pretty sure Ross Barkley's got to be on the lowest part of the list. But hey, fair play to you, Notts Forest, because you gave him the whole of Bedfordshire in that first 15 minutes. He nearly scored with a first long range shot. Goalkeeper just got down and kept that out. Second one swerved all over the place that he pushed out and a third one hit the post. You thought it's only a matter of time before Ross Barkley does something magical and and, and gets us going. We, the first 15 minutes, we really did come out of the traps. I know Ariki should have scored in the first couple of three minutes, tried a fancy down finish that wouldn't have got to the goal line, even if Issa Kabore wasn't there. But once we'd ridden that, not even Storm, that, that chance, it was the Barkley show for 15 minutes. Every time he got the ball, he had an ocean of space to drive into and he don't need inviting twice. Yeah, Roy the Rover stuff really, wasn't it? And he thought that that's what you need, a, a player of his magnitude to step up and do the business. And yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, I mean, he's got two on target, so that's what you've got to do. Um, the other one, not quite, but, uh, you know, it was it was quite some performance for, for a little while. And then really after that, Forrest did come back into it. And by the time they scored their goal, they, they were knocking on the door a little bit. I mean, not, Smashing the door down, but knocking the knocking on the door, and it's just so frustrating because Reese Burke had kept one off the line, unbelievably so. I mean, that is one hell of a block. If there's ever a block of the season, um, then that has got to be up there um, to to stop that on the line. And then, you know, just a couple of minutes later, he just loses Wood, who slips around the back of him, and it's fairly routine routine finish with Wood. And what's that? Three, three against Luton this season from from him, and it's it just shows you, doesn't it? Because I mean, he's not particularly highly rated anywhere in football. I wouldn't have thought so, um, but he knows where the goal is, and if you stick it in the air in the box, then he's pretty effective. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I mean, the game changed after fifteen minutes because men twelve, thirteen, and fourteen started getting involved, didn't they? I mean, the referee was an absolute nonsense from start to finish. Some of the decisions he gave were were baffling. Uh, wrong and just so well it's no surprise is it that they've got a former referee in the stand they've been bitching and whinging all for about the last fortnight since that Liverpool drop ball about decisions going against them and now all of a sudden they get every single decision going in their favour um, you're right about that Reese Burke clearance I mean not just the clearance 
but the fact that he just charges they highlight it on match of the day the uh the fact that he doesn't stop he just keeps on going charging i mean Origi shouldn't give him the chance to clear it every you know the top strikers in this league we mentioned in the sort of preview podcast they hadn't scored for three games but at the same time we did say their front four are a threat yeah. there's got to be a reason why they're not scoring goals well you just saw it there didn't you if that was a, a Liverpool striker or or a Hoyland or, you know, one of the top strikers, they're in the top bins. Yeah. He drives it into the bottom corner where he's allowed a defender to get into it. A much better finish than his first one, which, like I say, wasn't even going to get to the goal, even if uh, Kabore wasn't there. But ultimately, you give a defender a chance. You can't really complain when he then gets in the way and keeps it off the line. My biggest fear, though, was that Kaminsky didn't realise that he'd blocked it and ball was going to hit Kaminsky. But luckily, he just kind of reacted as it bounced off of him because I think Origi was closing in for uh, for a moment. But... Yeah, from there we just couldn't get composure, could we? We couldn't get couldn't get organised really, and that was the thing. And if you look at the goal, it's so annoying. I mean, to be fair, Kaminsky's cleared the ball quite a way up, but when we're unorganised, is he better off just banging it in the stands? I suppose the ball comes in just as quickly as it goes out in this division, doesn't it? But then uh, the header comes forward. Kabore's kind of not sure whether to go with Williams or Gibbs White. Then Mengi's not sure whether to go with Gibbs White and close him down or go back and deal with the cross. Me personally, and this is so easy to say, sat there, particularly after it, but the threat's wood in the middle, really, yeah. not the cr- not the crosser. If he happens to cross it, just be there to get rid of the cross. But, he, you know, we're talking split-second decisions from inexperienced defenders. You can't really call, call him out for that. He, he chose Gibbs White, he didn't block the cross, and then, like you say, Wood's lost Burke and... Um, Nothing Kaminsky can do with the finish and we're one nil down and up against it. Yeah, it was so disheartening at that point because Luton had been on top, were playing well, really. I mean, they'd had their chances, let's be fair to them, um, the ones that you pointed out for Marie. But Luton had been given as good as they got as well. And um, yeah, and it, it, we talked about it so often, we? You can see the first goal, it cuts the atmosphere, really. and. Um, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't the Watford and Sunderland levels that Rob Edwards had called for in the first place, but it, it, it whatever there was, it cut it anyway. It was better. It was it certainly wasn't a Sheffield United situation. It, it was a better atmosphere. You just ultimately, everyone knows you're ten games from the end. You can't, you know, you can't you can't sell a dud. Really, do you know what I mean? It's like. If we were 24 points adrift, knowing that if you lost, you went down, then that might be different, but we're not. And it, and it's hard and, you know, there's no energy in the players to lift the... the it, it, it's just different. It's not a derby. It's not a playoff semi-final. There's not that jeopardy on it. Maybe if it's Fulham or we're in that situation, then it's a completely different ball game. I understand Rob wanted the noise and everything else. And actually, I think we did get to them in that first 15 minutes. But but also they've got a few players who've been here before, so they kind of knew what it was all about. Toffolo at left back, he p- played in the um, playoff semi final against us, didn't he? For Huddersfield, Gibbs White will have been here before. One or two others sort of dotted around. I think Alanga was part of that Man United squad that come down here in the Carabao Cup a couple of three years ago. So a few of them, were, you know, it's not like they were there for the first time. So. Yeah, it did silence it. Of course it silenced it because, you know, at that point, everyone's like, oh shit, this is really getting away from us now in terms of the survival battle. But thankfully the boys on the pitch didn't think that, you know, and kept on going, as they always do. I thought we were level five minutes from half time for the corner that you mentioned that came about from the Williams clearance, which, I mean, nine times out of 10, that's in the top corner, isn't it? That clearance, how he's got that over the crossbar, I've no idea. I mean, Pelly did brilliantly to go past Murillo um, in the first place, lifted it over his head. And a really, we've said so many times, haven't we, on these podcasts this season, we get into these positions, no problem. And the final ball's crap. Well, the final ball wasn't crap this time. Unfortunately, it was just Reese Burke who was attacking it. He's not a natural attacker. He's more a defender. Had it been Carlton Morris, it was 1-1 for all ends, uh, for all money. But from the resulting corner, and ball comes over. It gets recycled back out, doesn't it? It comes over uh, and Ted Mengi controls it, belts it home, and everyone, he's off doing a 
fancy dance and yeah. everyone's happy and, you know we've got we've probably got what we deserved out of the half so i don't think we deserve to be behind at the over the course of the 45 minutes um and then out of nowhere a referee's whistle goes and uh i haven't seen a conclusive angle that says to me that he handballed it all the tv cameras i've seen have been from the main stand side and you can see it hits his thigh but there's nothing, and you can see that his arm is in the vicinity, but there's nothing actually that shows that he hits it. And, and if you watch the West Ham game or see the highlights of the West Ham game later, they have exactly the same thing with their winning goal, only they can't see a conclusive angle there because the goalpost's in the way, yet they still change the decision. The only thing I would say is Mengi didn't seem too surprised when the goal was chalked off, so maybe he did handball it, but bloody unlucky. Yeah, I got I got a few angles of it in the in the press box, and it it does hit his arm, um, but he's not moved his arm to the ball or anything. Um, and it so the ball comes over, and he almost controls it with what WWF fans of the nineteen eighties will recognise as the bread box, <laughs> and his arms by the side of him, so it hits him on the thigh almost, and does touch his arm. There's a, there's an argument to say that it may be that alters the trajectory of the ball not hugely I, I wouldn't say but it does it is there but then the frustration of it for me and I've not heard anyone talk about this is the inconsistency of of that action because if he's defending a cross and it does exactly the same thing and they call for a penalty it'll go to VAR and they'll say his hand's not in an unnatural position no penalty so why was that why would that be different in the other box when you're going to score a goal it's it's a it's a very frustrating one that's where we are with this stupid handball rule though isn't it uh, for an attacking point if you get any benefit from it it's a handball so by the letter of the law if it did strike his hand then it is it should be written off but you you're right in two different situations had it been the other way around had their defender have done that then it would have been crack on i don't see how the same action can be different to two ends of the pitch. That's something that they need to sort out. I mean, they need to sort so much of VAR out in the summer, but that's certainly something that they need to sort out. And hopefully we get a Euros where VAR works and we can start to learn from it because it's just an absolute nonsense. As I say, more controversy in the West Ham game this weekend, even more controversy in the Burnley-Brentford game this weekend. Four games this weekend and three of them are huge VAR fuck-ups or contro con con can't even get the word out, controversy. I mean, 75% of your games, Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we don't go in 1-0, sorry, 1-1. We do go in 1-0 down, and I think it was pretty obvious there was going to be no Alfie Doughty coming out. I mean, people behind me were, abs were calling him like a sulking child and all of this. I'm like, fucking open your eyes for Christ's sake. The, bl the boy couldn't move to start the game. He, can't, he still can't move. He's still giving everything he can. He took a knock, didn't he, when he rescued a ball on the touchline and he came out of that quite gingerly. Despite that, he set up what we thought was the equalising goal. You know, give the boy some slack. He's played every minute possible in recent games. I think the only time I can remember him resting was 20 minutes against Everton in the Cup when they brought Joe Johnson on. Apart from that, he's played every game and apart from the few minutes that he missed at Liverpool when he got wiped out in that challenge when he thought they'd put us back in the game with um, with that cross. Absolutely knackered. Uh, I believe they're saying it's a hamstring injury he's got, but my understanding is it's just general fatigue. And uh, the week on the beach, he'll be, um, he'll be okay. So yeah, Alfie's off and uh, it's, it's all change, isn't it, at this point? Um, and then Corley Woodrow comes on for him. I think we've moved Chio from the right to the left and we've got Kabore and it's literally anyone who could move at that point has moved. The second half kind of started quite badly, didn't it? They were through on goal within about 30 seconds. Thankfully, Gibbs White uh, hit Kaminsky with his shot. And then they've had another chance, haven't they? They played, to, to be fair, nice one-two between Alanga and um, Chris Wood. Alanga shoulder barges, if I'm being kind. Chio out of the way. And then yet again tries another fancy finish. Kaminsky makes a great save. Ted and Mengi on the line to stop his former Manchester United colleague uh, from putting them 2 0 up. And then from there onwards, it changed. 
how how unlucky can Luton keep getting with these injuries? Because it, it's ridiculous the amount of players that are out, but they're all key players as well. Doughty, one of the standout performers for Luton this season. Pelly on the day, absolutely fantastic. But you've got your top scorer out, your talismanic captain has a cardiac arrest, your, um, Osho, who gives everything, he's gone. Um, Dynamite central midfielder. Yeah, Jacob Brown, who was really coming into his own in the in the pressing style that they they would they'd adopted really since really since that Brentford game. Um, not that they weren't a pressing team anyway, but they changed things up a bit. Uh, it's just it's just all over the place, and uh, that, that, that's why I think really you've got to be quite impressed with um, Luton hanging in there and getting anything from that game because Nottingham Forest weren't light really anywhere as far as I'm aware they haven't signed any more like players for 25 30 40 million that weren't on the pitch and Luton have got a whole team that costs less than less than 20 well all the summer signings cost less than 20 uh, which is probably entirely less than Gibbs White they've got about 11 players to possibly pick from and most of them were signed on a free <laughs> and um and uh, and not in the forest have, have spent hundreds of millions of pounds to be three points ahead of Luton and still in the mire of a relegation fight with points deduction potentially still to come <laughs> it, it it's a, it's admirable from Luton's point of view that that is the case because it shouldn't be when when that's happened and when you know when forest fans were giving it the big one on the youtube comments of the preview podcast hello everyone um you know they were they were talking like they haven't like they haven't been in the like they've been in the premier league forever <laughs> and they haven't this is their second season yeah i checked my notes with regards to where uh, they're getting promoted to the premier league would you believe they got promoted at the same playoff final that we got promoted just 12 months earlier yeah incredible isn't it yeah exactly <laughs> and they're, they're talking like they've got one one comment banging on about well we've got a minted owner but well, okay you've got a minted owner that's broke the rules because you're up for a charge and, and see where that gets you. You've got a minted owner that doesn't know where you've come from. 20, 23, 24 seasons in the second or third tiers, and then you don't want to give any money to the <laughs> to, to the Football League um, as one of 10 teams in the Premier League that don't. Scandalous, really. But the fact remains, they were, they were talking like they beat us all the time. And how many games have they not beaten us for? Again, I'll check my notes. Uh, that'll be six. Six, exactly. <laughs> so six games they've not beaten us for, yet they're amazing. Uh, and only three points above Luton because their team, which I'm going to shout out to Mark the Hatter on Twitter, worked out that they've spent over £330 million in the last season. Uh, and Luton have barely spent a penny. <laughs> and they are... Well in the well in the shit, they can't beat Luton apparently. Absolutely, yeah. I saw a post on Twitter from one of their fans, and, and hey, there are some good Knotts Forest fans out there. So you know, we're not picking on them all as a collective, but oh, well, I, the ones that posted on YouTube on our preview podcast, I mean, it's blatantly obvious that most of them, the closest they've been to a football ground, is the one they built in their underpants out of Lego, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's. Um, but that's what I'm talking about. So I'm not talking about there are. There's every fan base has good fans and bad fans, but all the ones that were on our YouTube comment, bar one, who was reasonable, you know who you are, um, well, well, they've got their opinions way out of whack. And uh, apparently we were rude, even though we bigged up your front four, who were pretty good. Um, but then we told you about the facts of um, Premier League financial charges and this story about not wanting to give nine hundred million pounds to the football league, even though you've been there most for most of the people. Most of the people watching this, the demographic of people, would have been only supporting that club in the championship and the division lower when they got relegated. Don't forget that. So it's it's bizarre. It really is bizarre. But um, I hope you're doing all right and that you um 
you had a good day yeah but for the ones that have got ideas of delusion um you know i saw someone on the on on twitter again it's not exactly the most sort of worthwhile sort of platform to base opinions on but said it was like a premier league team against a championship team no it wasn't mate because the premier league team would have been 10 up and the, and, and and your lot couldn't finish their dinner so uh <laughs> no wasn't like that at all um a couple of in- interesting incidents in that second half james they both involved murillo who to be fair i think as a defender he looked really really good generally when i say i think he's brazilian if he's not, I apologise, but I think he's Brazilian. Generally, when I see a Brazilian defender, I think I, I, because, you know, they they all play, don't they? But none of them really, with the exception of Thiago Silva, none of them really want to defend. But this boy could defend. But early on in the second half, fouled Carlton Morris, trod all over his calf, knew exactly what he was doing there, got away with it. And again, technically, he's done nothing wrong with Pelly, But surely you've got a responsibility to the safety of your opponent. The ball's out of play or it's about to go out of play. You don't have to shove him with that excess force, knowing that there's a sponsor board right there. And yeah, OK, sure, it's the way our ground's made up and everything else. But no one else does it. Just just ease him in so that you ease it out of play. There was extra force there. He Again, he knew he was going to get away with it. He knew what he was doing. But ultimately, he's injured an opponent there when he didn't need to injure him. Yeah, I mean, it's probably... Are overly forceful, but he's also landed very awkwardly as well. I mean, he's gone smack his head into the, the hoardings as well as rolling his ankle while also having a dodgy knee from earlier in the game. He's had a full gamut of um, injuries there. Uh, it's it's a nasty one. Just step in front of him though and see the ball out. There's no need to absolutely muller him like that. I mean, even if you shove him, just shove him. There is still enough t- space between the pitch the sponsor board and the wall the other side that just got dangerous and it didn't need to I didn't like it no no one did I mean it's it's nasty and you can hear it I you, I could hear it very clearly over the other side of the pitch from the bobbers and it was it was a loud old bang and you know Pelly doesn't stay on the ground he's made of um, you know steel that guy and he's he looked fairly dazed for a while didn't get up and then obviously tried to run it off because that's what he's like but didn't didn't work and he, he went down on the turf and and he was off and you're like well, how is how is this luck there is no luck when the, the best player in the park for Luton goes off you can't say that he's been overworked in his um in, this season at all really he's had to play have a bit part role really for much of it which is something new to him since since he ever well ever since he moved into midfield for sure but all through the leagues he's been a mainstay that one season where he was injured all the time and then after that he never got injured at all did he and then um, yeah to see him go off was disheartening after doubt he'd already gone off um, because there wasn't many other players creating much um, in an attacking sense Clark wasn't having one of his best games his touch was off I and mean, everything that went to him sort of bounced off him and then attacks broke down it was frustrating and yeah, at that stage, well, which is probably why the crowd was so quiet, really. It just felt like, well, this is a game too far. I mean, we all knew it was a possibility because you can't keep going and going. On the third game of the week as well with absolutely no players and the ones that you've got are battered and bruised and knackered and demoralised from the Wednesday game for sure. But um, they they kept in it and that's that's all you've got to do. You've got to fight, haven't you? absolutely and that's the one thing these boys will always do we know that we've seen that in the 29 games from start to finish maybe with the exception of the 45 minutes on Wednesday so yeah I didn't like that about Murillo but where you've got to hold your hands up and say fuck me that is class it's the free kick because oh, the one who's tried to, 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 to I mean obviously Kaminsky was nearly done by Eze last Saturday in similar situation not from a free kick but open play so they must have worked out that his starting position is quite high in line with the fact that our defensive line is quite high. But to ping that with that accuracy, I mean, it's a brilliant save from Kaminsky as well because he's not under the bar when he tips that over. He has to get a serious hand to that. If he just gets a, like an Onana hand to it, that still goes in. That is an incredible piece of skill. So yeah, I didn't like the physicality that he knew what he was doing and knew he would get away with it. I'm not saying he should have been booked or anything like that. I'm not. I'm just saying you don't need to do it. 
But that free kick was genuine quality. It was. Um, I can't think of a game, though, to be fair, where t- Thomas Kaminsky hasn't had to make two, three, four, five saves. There was another one. He did that. He also blocked Gibbs White. And then when he ran through, uh, there was another one, which it doesn't come to mind at the moment. But, you know, he's he's had to play his part to keep that scoreline down. And uh, that would have been the worst thing if that went in, because it was already sort of moving to moving quite flat and slow. And they were defending low as well, which, as we saw against the Sheffield United game, when Luton had more players to to choose from and more options to come off the bench, it was just difficult to do, to break them down. Which is a concern um, going forward, I suppose, but we'll deal with that when we come to it. Um, So yeah, if that went in, it would have just been all over. Yeah, it would. I mean, if any of them, you know, if they'd gone 2-0 up at any point, that was it. I don't think we'd have had it in us to go and get two goals. But I mentioned in the preview podcast, James, they were one win in 13 in all competitions inside 90 minutes going into the game at Kenilworth Road. They're now obviously one win in 14. And you can see why. Because at 1-0, off comes every attacking player who's replaced with a much more defensive-minded player with the exception of whoever it went off for, Cull- uh, for Callum Hudson-Odoi. Um, but Felipe came on, Dominguez came on for Gibbs-White and all of us, you know, and they brought another full-back on and gone three at the back uh, with two wing-backs. Sorry, brought another centre back on and gone two at the back uh, with with two wing backs. Um, and slowly and slowly they got deeper and deeper. And it was so reminiscent of last Saturday. It was untrue. Crystal Palace did the exact same thing. If there is one thing you don't do to this Luton side, you do not hang around with them when it's one nil because they score goals. They are now on the longest consecutive scoring run in the Premier League as of right now. Having, after Tottenham were blanked on Saturday night, 17 uh, games consecutively uh, that they've scored in since that Manchester United away game uh, back in November, I think it was. 19 if you include, uh, against Premier League teams, if you include Everton and Man City in the, cu- in the cup. The one thing that is a guarantee with this team is they're going to score a goal. So why, when you're 1-0 up, you would take everyone off and go on the retreat when you've already coughed up 19 points from winning positions this season, when you can't defend a set piece for love nor money. And we saw that they couldn't with the corner in the first half that Mengi scored from. You just knew what was coming. And much like last Saturday, it came and uh, it came in the last minute. And obviously Luke Berry's replaced Jordan Clark, who, as you said, wasn't having his finest game. It was literally the last throw of the dice. It was only Hashioka of any kind of seniority of an outfield player who didn't come on. And obviously he wasn't going to throw him straight on after the struggles that he had on Wednesday night. And that's although he was ready to come on when the equaliser happened, actually. Um, Corner, we finally get a corner. We struggled to get set pieces, didn't we? We just couldn't get no one out wide to get the set pieces. But finally we got a set piece. Chio's actually had Toffolo on toast for a little bit, hasn't he? He's got him in the book. So we've got the corner down that right-hand side. I thought, you know, that he brought Berry on to take some set pieces because at Everton in the cup game, it was Berry's corner to Woodrow. But no, Ross Barkley took the corner and that's absolutely fine. Obviously, Ross has scored from a few corners this season, so I thought that's that's why it was. But you could see there was an overload at the back post. Uh, You know, there was Burke there, there was Mengi there, there was Chong. So Chong was on the goalkeeper. There was um, Berry in and around that area. And obviously Morris was in that area too. So you knew where the corner was going. Didn't exactly telegraph it. And Burke wins the header on the edge of the box, heads it down. If Berry didn't get it, Chong would have done, but I'm delighted that it was Berry that got it. Swiveled, volleyed under the keepers, through the keeper's legs. Thankfully this time, Williams's clearance didn't get over the crossbar, got under the crossbar and uh, the relief as much as the celebration was just brilliant. It was because I I thought that the game was done. Um, even despite all these late goals that, that keep happening, there's going to be a time where it doesn't. And that did, was did you think it at that point though, or did you sense it like me? Hang about, this is a team who don't win many games of football. They're taking every attacker off. They're trying to see it out. They've missed God knows how many chances. I mean, like I say, it could not have been any more reminiscent of Crystal Palace last last Saturday if you tried. All it, all that was different was they were wearing white and blue red, as opposed to red and blue of Crystal Palace. It was the exact same film with pretty much the exact same ending. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I didn't, to be honest. I, I, I was 
firmly in the in the camp of well Luton's races run here because nothing has gone right more injuries in the game the referee seems to favour everything that Forrest did somebody put on Twitter um, fair play to you <laughs> said Darren England go, <laughs> goes to sleep in Forrest bed sheets it just felt like that um, with his Forrest pyjamas on <laughs> exactly uh, and so it gets to the 89th minute and um, hadn't really had much change out of like you say set pieces or anything and, and really every time a, a ball had gone in they they're quite big, those forest defenders, and they they dealt with it quite well. So uh, I'm glad that they didn't on this occasion and and, and fell asleep, fell asleep somewhat. Burke's head was fantastic. You, you have to give it, but you, Barry still has a lot of work to do there because he has to swivel a. It's not like a ninety degree turn that I think he has to give it. Give Near it, enough one eighty, give it the strictly come dancing vibes there, and and get on get on that, and to hit it with such power that it goes through a bunch of legs, and whoever's on the line can't keep it out is a credit to him. But how many times have we seen him do it throughout the the, the divisions, and um, I think everybody was delighted by that. I, I, I want to give a shout out actually because Mike Simmons from the Luton News, who I sit next to in the press box, he called it at half time that Bez is going to come on and score. So well done, Mike. <laughs> yep, no credit where it's due, Mike, and we know he watches as well. So um, yeah, yeah, great shout that one. You know, what? honestly, I'm not just sitting here saying it after the event. After all these chances got missed, you could just see that you can just see why they don't win games of football. Um, you know, it wasn't like the game. They'd done the same thing at their place, right? 2-0. So they're slightly further ahead. You kind of thought in that game, well, 2-0, they'll see it out from here. Off came everyone. Joe Worrell and the likes came on. Within 10 minutes, we're back in the game. To do an exact replica at 1-0 uh, baffled me. But yeah, no, I, I, I didn't know if the goal was coming, but I knew a chance was going to come because we always get the chance and we hadn't had the chance in the second half, had we really? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, fell to the right place, uh, right man at the right time. To fire it 1-1, one, one. seven minutes of injury time. How's there only seven minutes? Yeah. I mean, every time Gibbs White stopped, he f- spent 30 seconds on the floor in that second half, telling Kenworth then to fuck off and everything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, not the wisest idea you've ever had in your life. Probably not going to play here again very often, so don't need to worry about it. It's only seven minutes. Should have been pushing double figures because the Pelly incident took it's at least half of that. Yeah. Um, to be honest, when the seven went up and we've equalised, I'm... I'm happy with the point. So seven's okay, but it should have been more. I was thinking, don't throw it away as well, because they had, they went down Luton's end a couple of times and just thinking, don't hang a cross up there for somebody to nod in. And, and, well, that was the, we've seen it so many times. Well, that was the crazy thing, wasn't it? Andros Townsend went and got the ball back and was like charging around like a bull in a china shop to go and get it back. And I'm like, built a fucking thing in the stand. Yeah. <laughs> get, it, you know, get it away from, like you say, their, their issues. However, the first minute of... Injury time. There's a foul on Kabore down the left-hand side. Sorry, down our right-hand side, their left-hand side, by Toffolo again. The linesman's flagging and Mr. England completely ignores him. Now, if he gives the free kick, Toffolo has to go. It's as simple as that. It's, another, it's exactly the same as the one that he's booked when he took Chio out. So Toffolo's off the pitch. We have seven, those seven minutes of injury time against 10 men and they're struggling to defend set pieces or balls into the box with 11. There could have been a winner there for us. It's just an absolute shambolic refereeing decision. I mean, you've seen, you've all seen the video of the Ross Barkley tackle that's gone viral on that's the, the internet, one. and quite rightly so, because that is a perfect tackle. I've no problem, well, I have got a problem with him pulling it up as a foul, but Gibbs White makes the exact same tackle 60 seconds later on the opposite side of the pitch. It's crack on. Feel free. No way. I mean... There probably is nothing in it, right? So to the genuine Knott's Forest fans, there's probably nothing in this. But when you've got a former referee sat in the stands, right, and all this bollocks of reports and stuff and coming out with all this nonsense in his newspaper columns, you are throwing yourselves open to corruption arguments and things like that from all sets of fans and everything else. And as I say, they've bitched and whinged since that Liverpool dropped ball a couple of weeks ago and they got absolutely everything out of him on Saturday. And it's not the first time that referees have gone right against us but there was no consistency in his decision making whatsoever but 
he has to send Toffolo off. Why would you? E they never ignore their linesmen. It's not like he couldn't see him because they're all mic'd up and he'll have been shouting, woo, foul, foul, foul. But he has ignored him. Yeah. I've not seen a referee play advantage at Kenilworth Road all season. And now because he's got to send a bloke off and then go on, crack on. Well, it's on the fucking halfway line. Where's the advantage? It was it was one of the worst performances. I feel like Terrible. It, I feel like we're saying this a lot, but um, that's only because the the good ones are few and far between. But you know, Sonny Singil had a great game, very good the other day. So fair play to him. So you got to shout at the referees that do have a good game. But got criticised for signing autographs. Wow. Well, well, I mean, that's criticising for signing because he had a good game. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it was absolutely shambolic. The Barkley one is the is the one that was directly in front of me where I was sitting, and he couldn't have timed that better. Um, it can't be in the, I don't know what the interpretation is. It cannot be that just because he's fallen over because. Oh, well, he does five, five it, rolls, doesn't he? That's that the thing. It can't be that. He's got the ball. It's not malicious. It's not dangerous. It's just a good sliding challenge. Um, so that one would be bonkers. Um, Carlton Morris was getting, you know, physically assaulted pretty much. Um, Rillo hanging around his neck, raked down the calf, all that sort of stuff, and he was going ballistic because he just wasn't getting anything from it. And it's it, it's not um, it's not rose tinted spectacles or has tinted spectacles to say it. It was a shambolic um, referee performance, and it it stunts any momentum as well. I mean, there wasn't much anyway, but any anything you could get going got blown up, and then. When you think you should have a free kick, nothing ridiculous. I mean, not sending Toffolo off probably wouldn't have had an impact. I mean, there's six minutes left. Maybe they'd have seen the six minutes out. But he's going to play in the next game now, isn't he? Whereas he should be on the pitch to play in the next game. So if he does something useful in that next game, then he gets to do it when he shouldn't be on the pitch. He should have been off for two yellow cards. He would have been booked. There's no doubt about that. Unless, you know, we had another Casemiro incident. Because it's exactly the same thing that he's just been booked for. Cynical, takes out Kabore. Well, I mean, he, he booked Kabore early on and then he's walking the tightrope of and that's, red for nothing. And I'm not even so, sure that's a that foul. Wasn't, Gibbs White's on his way down so, long before he gets anywhere near Kabore. Certainly wasn't a yellow, I don't think. And, right. um, but to give it that early. And then a number of their players making multiple challenges, bad ones, and not getting anything from it. It's, yeah. Eight fouls committed by the two centre-halves that started the game, Murillo and Bolly. Not a single yellow card anywhere to be seen. And don't forget, amongst those eight fouls, the incident between Murillo and Pelli wasn't one of them because yeah. nothing was given. Quite rightly so. That's um, it, uh, it wasn't a foul. Yeah, if we see Darren England again in these last nine games, you've got to fear the worst, haven't you? Because uh, that was not good. Uh, they nearly won it, didn't they? Ryan Yates flashed a shot. I'm not overly sure he was shooting or just getting the ball away from or whatever he was doing. It fizzed past the post and my God, thank, thankfully it was a foot wide because if it was in, it was in. My heart was in my mouth for that one. Uh, no no two ways about it. It was a rifle of a shot, wasn't it? And um, uh, that's what I mean. It was like they, they still had a, they still carried a bit of a threat going forward even though in that final probably 10 minutes before the 90 were up, it was Luton pushing because they'd decided to settle for that one and, and sit back low. But I mean, they sat back low anyway for the whole of the second half, really, because, and I don't blame them, it worked perfectly for Sheffield United and it's just that other teams have come to Kennel Road and thought, well, we can blow you out of the water, whereas these lot of clearly worried that they can't finish games off. Sat quite low for a team who don't counter-attack, don't they? Hello, YouTube yeah. comments. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, it was another one. We got told that they didn't counter-attack, which um, they clearly did. Um, it's pretty much all they did. Um, but I, you know, I can't blame them for that. And that's it's a tactic that Luton have struggled with before. Um, and so when when all that's happening, I, I can't just I wasn't seeing a goal. So when it comes, I was out of my seat. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Let's hear from the goal scorer then, Luke Berry, because I mean, you, you can't not be anything but pleased for Luke Berry. I mean, he's come through the leagues with us. He had that horrible injury in League Two, didn't he? He hasn't had the minutes that he'd have wanted in the time. Uh, since then, again, understandable. Um, 
But he is Johnny on the spot whenever a late goal is needed, isn't he? And uh, he popped up at just the right time. So uh, James caught up with him after the game in the mix zone. Uh, talk to us about that winner then. Um, I mean, you've scored in every division you've played for Luton in um, and you've had to bide your time, a lot of time spent on the bench, but coming off yeah. and um, what, what were the instructions and what does it feel like to score that goal? Um, just go in there, try and sniff something out and um, play a little bit higher. So Ross told Ross to go a little bit deeper and just me try and sniff something. And um, frankly, what? I did in the, for the corner. I'm not normally in there for corners, so it's nice to be in there. Um, Never going to win a, I might win a header here and there, but I was, I was, no, I was going to sniff something from the floor. So, um, yeah. And you, know, you get to batter it through a couple of bodies, but was there, I mean, in previous divisions, you've scored a goal, you go and celebrate. Did you have to look around and think, oh my God, is VAR going to yeah. get into play or something? I don't know. I didn't, I just, I, it was a bit like the Millwall celebration where I just gone, I just gone run to the main stand. Um, but no, I didn't actually think about VAR and then, then, they were checking so I was like, what the hell are they, what are they checking? That would be horrible, wouldn't it? If I just ran <laughs> and they just, yeah, but thankfully they gave it. I mean, because there was one that wasn't there in the end of the first half when yeah. Hedden scored and it's Think, a strange one because, I mean, it sort of does hit his arm, but mm. if that's a defensive one by the laws, his arm's not in an unnatural position, you no. don't give it. No, we only saw it from one angle. It didn't actually look like it, it was tight. It was like here, wasn't it? Yeah. So I, I couldn't see it from another angle, but it would look tight. Yeah. But I mean, ultimately, you, you come away with a with a point, and uh, you know, with all the adversity you're sort of facing, it's a uh, it's a good afternoon, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We we t we didn't we had to not lose really. If we lost that six points, is quite a big big amount to come back from. You, Pelly, and a couple of the other lads have obviously been in a relegation dogfight in the championship that went down to the last day. And yeah. how much can you draw from that in in this situation? Um. I think we can, yeah. It's just, it's just it's like we did today, staying in games, not being silly, taking every point when it comes. I think sometimes you can get sucked into, oh, yeah, but we, we, let's go for the win, let's go for the win. And then in these leagues, they can suck a punch and you go away with nothing. I think the key is to just pick up the points when we can, not be too greedy, and then the wins will come. Yeah, must be must feel good to get a late lever after the ones like Villa recently where they've they've yeah you know, yeah we to be fair I don't think we're anywhere near evens there I think we've been sucker punched a lot more than we've done people oh. so um, about time about time yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you lovely once again if you're listening uh, to the review podcast for the first time the mix zone at Kenworth Road is the main reception corridor and that's why you heard all of those trolleys in the background and things like that we've tried our hardest to get rid of it but you can't get rid of all of it particularly when Bez isn't the strongest sounding voice uh, in the world and also you could tell just how close to full time James was when he caught up with him it was an equalising goal not a winning one but it sure as buggery felt like a winning one didn't it yeah I mean I, I didn't realise I said it was a winner but yeah that's what I mean it felt like with it that's why that i would imagine they're probably more disheartened by that result and luton are more heartened by it as it was in the crystal palace one because luton were dead and buried and then they crop out come out of nowhere and get a goal and, and take a point and then suddenly their what would have been the six point lead over luton is now still only three and they're still in the mix considering they haven't won that many games um and yeah it's it, it's a it is a better one for Luton, like we said in the build-up. It's some. I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't think we did say must win this time, but it, it was one we had to win. But when you when the, the day plays out like it did in the way it did with all the things that went against Luton, and you get a point, and you're still in it, and you're still within touching distance. I mean, you kind it's kind of out of hands at the moment before the points deductions potentially come in. But it do, it doesn't cut you adrift which is the main thing. But what it also does is it puts us a result behind Everton now, whereas we were two results behind them going into the game. Their game that they didn't play this weekend, incidentally, was the Merseyside derby. So while they've got a game in hand, you've got to think that nine times out of 10, they're getting diddly from that. Yeah. So it puts us sort of a point closer to them. We focus so much on Notts Forest in these two games. Of course we have. They're the team that we're playing. But Everton have gone nowhere. Brentford have gone nowhere. They're only another point further on, Brentford, and they've got horrible next three games, much like ourselves. So, um, yeah, this this fight is still well and truly on. Really good point that you raised with Luke Berry in that interview about the people that were here for the great escape. 
with the so-called Great Escape in the Championship, much, much worse position than what we're in now. Uh, infinitely worse position than what we're in right now. And even in that last nine games, we took a 5-0 bop in from, yep. from Reading because I think we're all expecting to take a bit of a hide in from Man City, right? So if we match them up, we still lost 5-0 against Reading and still stayed up from a worse position four years ago. So, you know, there's no need to panic just yet. No one at the football club's panicking. We should absolutely stress that. They are all still in control of the situation. Not least the boss, Rob Edwards. And, uh, well, we sent Jimbo along to the post-match press conference and hear the thoughts of Rob himself. Well, the way, with the game, the way the game was going, really pleased in the end. Yeah, it's been a challenging week to say the least. And uh, look, I think not just football, life and everyone's lives, everyone's going through stuff. Everyone gets knocked down. Everyone gets disappointments. Everyone gets things go against them. And it's about how you deal with it and how you react. I think that's what's really important. And I think this this group have showed that's how you react. Um, they've got so much character. And no matter what's thrown at us at the moment, we'll keep going. That doesn't mean we're always going to get points. I know that. We're not always going to play well, but they'll always keep going and keep fighting. And um, yeah, that's why I love them for that. It's, it's a brilliant story, isn't it? To score in all yeah five divisions now. Uh, as she was just reminding me, I said all four a minute ago in one of the interviews. But um, yeah, brilliant, special moment for him. I think for the football club because it's, you know he's a club legend, isn't he? With what he's done for this football club, and uh, he's a, he's a, one of a number of them. And uh, yeah, really special moment for him today. You just hope that yeah that something lands. I mean, when, when he's come on quite a lot this year now, I think maybe eight times or so, and he's been close on a number of occasions to something. Uh, just thankful today in, in, in such an important game, he, he uh, finished it really well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult for us with a, a full group to, to be competitive in this league. So to be competitive, which we have, you know, we've drawn two games and lost a mad game by a single goal. You know, we've been competitive. Um, it, that, that's hard anyway. Never mind with what we what we're missing at the moment. And I love the group of lads that are playing and fit and available at the moment. But to have nine senior players out and the two more go down today as well, it's difficult for us. And um, there's so many people playing out of position. You know, even if it's just one position down or up in a, in a different kind of position, Issa on the left and Chio playing right back. Really, it was it was hard for us to 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 really get a rhythm and be at our best. We had lots of possession, but. Difficult to get behind Forest and create big chances. It was difficult. They defended well and low and slowed a lot of the game down in the second half, which is their prerogative. Thought the game was almost petering out, but again we popped up in, um, you know, with a with a set play. But set play it was important, and um, and then we wanted to try and push. You know, the crowd were up for it, but couldn't find uh, couldn't find another with where we would have been. You know, if we'd have lost the game, yeah, it would have um, it would have been a blow that for us. So. We can actually go into this break with it on a little bit of a high, even though we've not won the game. The, the manner of the performance and with everything that we've sort of gone through this week and with all the injuries, I think, you know, the lads have shown a lot of character. Yeah, they have indeed. Uh, not least bouncing back from Wednesday night to uh, refuse to lose on Saturday. Um, probably not the points that we wanted from the three games. Certainly not the points that we deserved from the three games. But ultimately, the position's still the same. We're still... Well and truly in this. And as I said before, we heard from Rob, we've done this before. We can do it again. Yeah. And not only have we done it before and in probably much more difficult circumstances, but when Nathan came in for that great escape run, he turned to all the players that had got them to that, got him where he'd got with Luton, which included Pelly, included Barry and the likes. Um, and again, if if they have to do that, Pelly stepped up. Barry has stepped up and got the goal and made a difference. So they're contributing still uh, and people were writing them off whether they could do it in the Premier League. I mean, they've not played regular, but when you're called upon, you've got to come up and do do something. And every single one, nearly, every single player has. Like Woodrow got the goal at Palace and, and Berry gets the goal at the weekend. Pelly puts in a great shift and that's what you've got to do. And um, that's why I think it's, the fight in this team is so impressive because it goes throughout the whole squad and knowing what this means to Luton, which is all important. Yeah. 
<laughs> we we, we kind of take it for granted because it's there every week, but it should never be taken for granted because you see other teams not show that fight and that character. And um, yeah, it's, if, if we stay in the league, that's a huge part of keeping us in the league. Um, let's talk about some key performers quickly before we go. James, uh, Ted and Mengi. Brilliant block in the second half from um, Alanga, as we alluded to earlier on. He was just an absolute rock throughout the the ninety minutes. Really, he it, his defensive performance was one of I'm not going to lose today, and um, and I thought he was brilliant. He was, and he's been brilliant for some time now, considering his age and his inexperience. Um, and that's what Luton have needed, really. I mean, yes, they've conceded goals, but. There's there's been mistakes that have led to many of them, and but in gen in general play, he's been absolutely outstanding, and, and that's probably why he's got the England twenty one under twenty one call up for the first time for this international break, and it's great for him. <laughs> it is, and I applaud him and congratulate him. England, please, please wrap him up in cotton wool. <laughs> play him if you want, but don't make him do extra shifts. Please be nice to him. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations to Tedden for that call up. Um, I mean, we've been on about Luton players playing for England all season, and we've had Joe Johnson at his age level. We've now got Tedden Mengi at his age level, and I noticed Henderson got injured for Ajax earlier. We could still have Ross Barkley for uh, his age level. Gareth, you know it makes sense. Don't worry about Ben White and all this nonsense. Go and. Go and get Ross Barkley. Uh, it makes sense to us, but you know what it'll do if that's the case. It'll just be straight on the phone to Manchester United and Cobby May New Year round. That's what it'll be. Despite all the evidence, all the evidence and the stats that tell you Ross Barkley is one of the most outstanding midfield performers this season. It's just because he plays for Luton, isn't it? It is. Let's hear from Ted and Mengi. He also stopped by for a chat with James after the game. All good to get a late goal. Um, I feel like we'll deserve a lot more for, uh, from that game. But yeah, it was a tough game. It was an important game for us. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we at least we got something from the game, which we're, we're, we're happy about. And uh, we can go into the into the break um, on a, on a some, somewhat positive. And you got the ball in there as well. Um, what did you make of that decision? Yeah, I thought I scored, but yeah, the referee made his decision. Uh, but... Yeah, we stuck at it and we eventually got the equaliser, so that was good for the team. That, that's going to give you a big yeah. shout, a big chance when you come back from the break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think when we come back from the break, we just got to keep it going. And I, and I, I have uh, all the faith in this team. Um, yeah, we surprise, we're surprising people each game uh, that comes by. So yeah, I've got all the faith in the, this team that we can. You know, we can. I, I definitely think we can stay up and we we'll keep scoring and we'll keep challenging the opponents and the, we'll keep being the underdogs that, that we are. In the tw- twenty one call up for you yeah. first time, yeah. and I'm happy with that. Yeah, I'm I'm delighted really uh, because I've had a tough tough couple of years with injuries, um, but yeah, um, it's a real real big achievement for me. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna take take the opportunity with both hands and just do as well as I can, and then after that, focus is back on the Premier League again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just come back healthy and not injured yeah. if we stay in this league and we therefore able to keep hold of him he's going to become a serious leader for this football club isn't he absolutely yeah I think he he really is um, my worry is if it, if they can't stay in the league whether somebody comes in for him because he's been a very good player he's young enough he's now got getting England recognition under 21 level so that's a worry. That's not a park it for now because <laughs> I like like Ted in there when he speaks and when the players speak and they say they've got absolute faith in the team and that they can still stay up. Yeah, you believe them. The the result gives you that anyway because y- you lose and then you're like, oh, then you start talking about you're not mathematically out of it, but everybody knows you kind of are really. I mean, the the the, the way things have been going this last month or or slightly more for Luton with injuries and and um, late late goals and obviously the Bournemouth one um, and losing three uh, losing four three sorry it, it's all a, it all builds on top of each other and sort of leads you to believe that it's just not going to happen but yeah 
that's that's what can these moments are really important to score in the 89th minute in a game that Forest probably looked like felt that they were going to see out changes the complexion of everything it makes them think that they can't hold on to leads either so that's going to be important when they play whoever they play in the running and um, yeah it, it just keeps looting in the fact you've got to play Everton as well Everton has still got to hear some charges Forest are coming up we hear Monday so by the time you're looking at you listening to this it could have already happened uh, so we wait to see what that is it's just um, yeah, well, I, I don't want it to get into the, the points deduction realm because it it's going to get messy, but whatever the situation um, after that goal, it's like, well, it's, it's three points and that's doable. Yeah, we're still in the mix without points deductions. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, you're right about them and their incapability of holding on to lead. You wouldn't trust them to walk your dog, would you? I mean, bloody thing had never come back. Um, yeah, we we literally, we are right in the mix. Um Pelly was your man of the match. He wasn't my man of the match, but I did think he played really, really well. I've been waiting for this because you, you, you teased this on WhatsApp for me. I, I did. I mean, Reese Burke just had an absolute monster game of football on Saturday. The block off the line was good enough to start off with. The assist, I suppose. The yeah. assist just caps it right off. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just brilliant. Isn't it? we, the one thing we knew when we were doing these podcasts in the championship is we had a Premier League defender if we could keep him fit. We still haven't quite kept him fit, but we know we've got a Premier League defender because he can carry the ball. He's athletic enough to do the job. He can go sh- go in with the when the striker goes short. He's happy to press him there and he can still recover. He's everything about a Premier League defender without those Premier League muscles in his legs to keep him fit long enough but that will change they'll get to the bottom of it like they did with Pelly eventually and when they do this guy is so so good and was that fourth game on the trot and he's getting better with each one he was excellent on Saturday he was my man match but not by a long long way because like you say Pelly was good but I just thought the key incidents Reese Burke was there or thereabouts yeah he was um he was also in in their goal as well I suppose um we didn't quite track the, the runner Wood, but I mean, Wood does that to a lot of, lot of yeah, teams. that's fair. Um, that's fair. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue against it if if you are putting it forward, which you are. So I'm not going to argue against it. He was, he was very good. The block for me was outstanding, um, and somehow to get a controlled header in that really tense moment and and knock it down for Bez um, was was clever really so um yeah fair play to him he's done he's done the business at both ends of the pitch yeah i mean what i like about the header is knock it down so barry hasn't got to chest it bring it down and hit it because he ain't going to have time to do that all barry's got to do much in the same way if you saw the manchester united third goal against liverpool when mctominay puts rashford in all he's got to do is put it in the bottom corner once barry's got round to face the goal all he's got to do is fire home he hasn't got to take a touch or anything else that we see defenders come along all too often. So yeah, I thought Reese Burke was excellent. So glad that he's having a run of fitness because I mean, listen, we've loved him on this podcast for ever since the day he signed. He's uh, he's an absolute top, top defender. Uh, the other one we need to give a proper shout out to, to Heath Chong looked like he was broken and battered when he left the pitch against Bournemouth. We didn't think he'd play. We assumed that there was something proper wrong with him. Thankfully it was only an impact injury and he was fine. And he played the whole 90 minutes. He went out to left wing back when Doughty went off at the start of the half. He ended up in that usual sort of number 10 position or behind the striker position once we started swapping everyone around and things. And as I said right uh, uh, earlier on in the podcast, had it not have been Berry who scored, it may well have been Chong because he was there anyway. Credit to him. Yes, we're all putting our bodies on the line and everyone, whether they've got knocks or not, whether they're in pain or not, if they can move, they play. But He's still done it. He played the whole 97 and however many minutes. And um, yeah, it was a good a good influence on the game. It's been impressive over a good period of time now because obviously there was that debate earlier in the season that is he a starter or is he better off the bench? And now he's out of necessity, really. He's, he's a, a first team starter and he's been growing ever since into that role. And I think everything he does is positive and he's, he's probing and... Um, good runs uh, he's got a bit of pace works he's great on the counter attack yeah 
for the second goal against Bournemouth, wonderful outside of the boot, through ball, that sort of thing. So he can he can spot those passes. And I mean, this is everything we we thought we were going to get anyway because we saw him absolutely destroy Luton in a Birmingham shirt. Um, and he hasn't quite hit those heights, but he's get he's on the road to to being consistent as well. And uh, yeah, it's really good for him. Um, He's a he's a, he's a very useful asset for this team, and um, now that he's a he's a starter, is he, he's one of those players that get gets bums off seats. I think so when he goes on a run, um, anything could happen. But he's it, it's less erratic now than perhaps it was before. So it's they're obviously doing some good work with him on the training ground. I think. Yeah, they are. Runner games helps as well, doesn't it? Uh, and then finally, we're not spoken about him too often uh, recently, but Ross Barkley. I mean pulled the strings to start with in that game obviously buoyed by the confidence of his goal at Bournemouth which was a brilliant goal at Bournemouth actually when you see it back it really is he just lashes it home the corner pinpoint onto Reese Burke's head uh, so a huge part in the goal you know may well have set up another counter attack had that ta- perfectly good tackle been allowed to um, go just just a brilliant footballer. We love watching him. We hope we stay in this league so we get to watch him beyond the end of this season. And we hope at some point Gareth gets his head out of his ass and watches him as well and that we take him to the Euros. Well, I can guarantee you that last one won't happen because <laughs> Gareth Southgate, uh, I don't, uh, he makes some odd, odd choices and all of them end in Henderson. So um, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, bet, don't bet anything you've got on it, let alone um, anything you don't want to lose. But everything else, yeah, he's um he's a he's a top performer. I mean, it when Bez comes on, he goes forward and and Ross Barkley goes backwards, uh, plays a bit deeper, which we've seen him do before, and he, he can he can do the quarterback thing um, in his sleep, really. Um, but yeah, to I wonder whether it might be a good shout to get him on those corners again, really, because it's usually doughty, isn't it? Um, and like you say, when Bez comes on, he, he used to usually take the take the corners. So if he's going to do that every time, um, we know how good he is at spraying sixty odd balls. Surely he could be, be doing that from a corner and um, get him on them. Yeah, as I say, I, I was just surprised because earlier in the season he flicked one on for Townsend to score at the back post, didn't he? And he scored against Chelsea, uh, direct from a header from a corner as well. So he's actually a threat in the box. So I guess, you know, but yeah, of course he's going to take a decent corner. He's, you know, he's the best footballer I've ever seen in a Luton shirt and may well see in a Luton shirt for plenty of um, time to come. That's it pretty much for this episode of the podcast. Just a couple of things. There's still people on social media, particularly in light of the fact that Joe Taylor scored a hat-trick yesterday asking why we can't bring him back. He may not have watched the Bournemouth Review pro, uh, podcast where I, I pointed it out. We don't blame you if you didn't. No one wanted to recycle that so soon. Um we cannot bring Joe Taylor back. In fact, we cannot bring any player back from their loan spell if they're in the Football League. The only ones we can bring back, uh, I should say, outside of a transfer window, which of course we are now, the only ones we can bring back are the ones that are on loan at non-league clubs because non-league have different transfer rules. So Jaden Luca, who's at Woking, if indeed we're, stru- uh, we're stuck in midfield, but given that there were three youth team midfielders on the bench, we don't appear to be. Uh, he could come back, for example, uh, but Joe Taylor can't come back. He's at Lincoln unless they decide to send him back because of injury or anything. He is at Lincoln until the final day of the Premier League season. So just to clear that one up, we will do a deep dive next week. Um, so if you've got any questions for us that you want us to answer whether it be on personnel whether it be on on anything to do with the Luton or even Premier League as a whole give us a shout and we will answer as many of them as we can do Uh, that will be out next week Uh, so keep your eye out for that one that is it for this podcast longer than normal but it is the only one that we're doing this week so we're giving you a few extra minutes talked about a few extra things absolutely you and me both i'm running out of 23 24 shirts to where we've been doing them that regularly we we just sit here we don't have to run around a pitch three times absolutely i've already gone back into uh, last season's shirts if you've heard any background noise throughout the course of this episode of the podcast again we have tried to dampen it down as much as possible we're recording this the day after the forest game which 
which is St. Patrick's Day. Obviously, there's a huge Irish uh, community in in it's Luton. A, it's a Coke, not a Guinness. It is. Oh, yeah, this is a poor man's version of fun. Guinness. Um, of course, there's a huge Irish contingent who are celebrating St. Patrick's Day. So we've tried to dampen it down. Um, but if you do pick up a little bit of background noise, that is what it's all about. Thanks for your thoughts and recollections, James. Really appreciate that. A good, uh, good podcast in the end. Good, sorry, good result to do a podcast for in the end. Well, yeah, in the 88th minute, I was thinking, how are we going to drag ourselves off the floor to get in here and do this? I don't um, think we were. <laughs> I think we were just going to put one of those BBT, BBC Two signs up with the long running beep for an hour and yeah. uh, cracked on. Yeah, but thank you, um, Luke Berry. You made my Saturday evening far, far better. Indeed so. Yeah, even without gladiators to watch. Couldn't couldn't have gladiators because the referee was stuck in the bloody stand, wasn't he? Scandalous. Absolutely indeed. Didn't even bring Sabre with him either, did he? Eh? <laughs> One job. We don't need any more injured play <laughs> injured people that get on throat. No, that's tr- that is true. Yeah. Get well soon, Sabre. Um <laughs> and of course all the all of the footballers, that is that's for sure. Uh thank you to uh, all of you for watching or listening. Once again, so many people came up to me during and after the game uh, on Saturday saying that they really enjoy the podcast and also thanking us, well, thanking me, but us for doing the Bournemouth review one. Yes, you're right. It wasn't the easiest one we've ever recorded, but in for a, in for one, you're in for them all, aren't you? And uh and so yeah, we had to we had to do that. More importantly, thank you for listening to that one if you did, yeah, because well no one needed remi- reminding of what happened there. So uh, yeah, thanks for all of your support. We really, really do appreciate it. Unless you're one of those stupid, idiotic Nottingham Forest commenters on these things. There you go. He said your name right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might be the last time we play them for a while. So uh, well, that would be good for them because they never win. It? It's very true. It's a good point thanks uh, for watching for listening as i say next episode will be the deep dive which will come out sometime next week uh, we'll wait for the points deductions and everything to be confirmed before we get stuck into the meat and drink of all of that thanks to the high town club for hosting our studio as always thank you to sean grant and the wolfgang for our intro music thank you to ed smith creative for all of the designs that you see on set and until next time my god do we need this break Come on, you atters. Actually, you, everyone in it has got this massive soul.